Hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. It feels like it's been a bit, so I'm glad to be back, especially with Dr. Lamb. Um, Dr. Lamb is going to be talking about another very important topic today, and that is kidney disease and pet birds. So uh, welcome, Dr. Lamb. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Anna Morel, yep. a, your sidekick. Yep. <laughs> um, so let's see here. I, um, I was, oh, so if anyone's been following uh, Lefebvre on social media, there's been some little hints being dropped um, to see if you can guess what our special webinar is going to be in October when we have um, you back with us, Dr. Lamb. And that is our hundredth, I cannot believe we're, I can't believe we're approaching that, our hundredth webinar. I know, it doesn't seem like there's that many. It seems like we yeah. started not that long ago. <laughs> I mean, that's just bonkers to think that we've done a hundred, I mean, it's like we're coming up on a hundred of these. Um, like you don't see a hundred episodes on any like Netflix. I mean, a hundred is a lot, so. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so just real quick then, um, the three, I guess there's three hints that we that are kind of in those those social media posting. One was um, the Scarlet Macaw, um, and we said it was going to be a wild webinar, and then it had a jungle theme. So if you put all those elements together, maybe someone guessed what the topic might be or what the special, uh, extra special component of this um, October webinar is um, going to be. So do you do you want to do the big reveal? Um, let me see if I could share my screen real quick because we got this really cute um, image of it. Okay, here we go. Ta-da! Okay, drum roll, please. Do you want to see what we're doing on this hundredth one? <laughs> I'll I'll give it away. So um, next month when I'll be meeting with you guys, it's going to be the twenty first, um, and where we're going to be doing our 100th webinar is at the Macaw Recovery Network in Costa Rica. Uh, so I'm going to be going down there for a week to just kind of help out with any veterinary work that they need. It's, it's, I'm still not too sure exactly what I'm going to get to do while I'm down there. So I'm really looking forward to it because it seems like it's going to be a lot of fun. I've been in contact with them for a little while now and with their main veterinarian that they have and um we've been going over you know stuff that we might potentially be doing together down there um but at the end of that week that i'm there we're gonna have the 100th webinar uh and at that point you guys will get to hear all about um what sort of fun exciting things occurred in the week while i was there and uh, I, because it's the macaw recovery network in costa rica of course it's going to be conservation focused um which is really exciting so we're going to you know uh, talk about ways that people are able to help get different species back out into the wild to uh, try to regain numbers of these individuals out there uh, where they are free and able to live out pretty exciting lives in the forest. So um, we're all looking forward to it. And I hope we get a lot of people join at that at that webinar because it should be pretty fun. And uh, Laura, there, I know that there's lots of giveaways, right? Yep, there'd be some giveaways. So yeah, another reason to tune in. This is gonna be awesome. Uh, I can't wait to see. I, I, <laughs> it'd be interesting if you're outside or inside when you're doing this. Yeah, I don't know yet. <laughs> find out <laughs> i expect like a safari hat i don't know so, <laughs> like, yeah uh, that's awesome all right there you go there's the inside scoop so mark your calendars for october 21st um that's when that exciting webinar is gonna happen our hundredth there we go okay so if you're just joining us um we are covering liver disease and pet birds today and um i imagine you have a another you always have these really good screen shares right so yes. Uh, did I, I need to make you a comment? Um, and just a reminder that um, if you have a question, to use the Q and A button, not the chat feature. So, with right. that being said, I'm sure we have a ton of questions. I mean, this is yeah, uh, it's a ton of questions about this. Topic, so, let's take All it right, away. I'll, I'll go ahead and share my screen, and it's about uh, not liver disease this month. Liver disease was last month. It's kidney disease this. Month. I'm sorry. Did I have the wrong? Uh, that's Thank okay. You. <laughs> Thank you. No, no problem. Let me go ahead and get my screen up here and lay out. 
Oops, what did I do? I made the wrong thing. Oh, that'd be funny if I was expecting Liv the Jessies again. Be like, wait, I'm that. My 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 slides are a little different. <laughs> Thanks for correcting me on that. All right. Well, I mean, the liver is very important. We talked about it last month. So if anybody uh, wasn't able to be there for that one, that one is available um, online on YouTube, just like all the other Lefebvre webinars that you can go back and review. But this month, we're going to be talking about kidney disease because, you know, the liver is really important. It's one of the major organs in the body, but the kidneys are also just as equally as important um, in the body for normal functions. So we'll go ahead and get right into it. And okay, so just like last time, I had an initial anatomy picture up to try to show you where the organ is in the body. Um, I believe I even used this exact same photo from the last time. And last time we were talking about the liver, which if you can see my cursor is right here in the center, there's two lobes to it. But our kidneys, what we're going to be talking about this time, is actually situated behind the intestine. So uh, looking at this anatomical um, layout of this bird here. We have the heart, we have the liver, and then we have down here the intestines with the uh, ventriculus, which is the uh, more muscular portion of their stomach, and then going down into the small intestines, the pancreas, um, and then back behind those intestines are the, the kidneys. Um, so since you can't see them in this little anatomical section here, what I did was get a um, radiographic picture as well so that you can kind of see the shadow of where they are on an x-ray. Now, the difference between these two pictures is uh, we're looking at the bird from the side on the x-ray image down here. And so when we're taking that x-ray, we're sort of looking at it from a different angle. Um, and the kidneys are sort of tucked up back here, again, just to give you um, an idea in comparison to our photo over on this side. The heart is right here, and then we have our liver down here, we have our stomach and small intestines, and then our kidneys up here. And Aurora's being a cat bird, come here, because he likes to get into the trouble while we're doing webinars, <laughs> because he's just goofy like that and wants to be the star of the show. So he was trying to eat one of the interns' uh, computers over there, which is not appropriate. So I had to stop. <laughs> uh, but back to the back to the kidneys. The kidneys are tucked up right high uh, underneath the pelvic area, sort of protected even actually by um, the bones of that pelvic area. Okay, so what do the kidneys do? Like we talked about that they're important, but what is it that makes them important? Well, one of the main things that makes those kidneys important is that they help to filter out toxins. And so there's various toxins that they'll be excreting from the body, but kind of the big one that we really know about in birds is called uric acid. And uric acid is a breakdown product from uh, the diet, really, and cellular metabolism processes. So when we take in protein or the bird takes in protein and the body breaks it down and then distributes proteins to different parts of the body to be used for various functions within cells, um, there are ways that those proteins get altered and broken down. Um, and when cells go through uh, normal cellular death and they have to be metabolized and things get broken down from that, there are byproducts that are produced um, during these normal cellular processes that technically are toxic. And so the body has to get rid of those toxins so that it maintains normal homeostasis and normal functioning. And one of the biggest ones the, for a breakdown from proteins is uric acid. And what uric acid is, is everybody who owns a bird sees uric acid every day when they look at their bird's poop. And so when a bird poops, in the droppings, there's three components to the droppings. There's the actual fecal component, the you know, poop itself, uh, which is, uh, you know, like the brown little tubular structure. The urate, which is the white portion, that is composed of uric acids. Um, and then the urine portion, which is just like the liquid that's around the, um, that's around the dropping. So you see uric acid every day when you look at your bird's droppings, it is that white portion that's there. That is what you are observing the body getting rid of because they don't want it to stay within the body because if it stays within the body, then there's problems that can occur. And we're gonna talk about some of those problems a little bit more. 
Other functions that the kidneys are involved with is balancing electrolytes. So I put down uh, various electrolytes. Na stands for sodium, uh, K stands for potassium, Cl is chloride, and P is phosphorus. And so there, those are different electrolytes that are within the body. Um, and the kidneys sort of help maintain them at the normal levels that they're supposed to be at. And then the other thing that the kidneys do is they affect blood pressure. So there's actually within the vessels, within the kidneys, um, different components that really play a major role in how the blood pressure just is within the body overall. So it's really important for maintaining that normal pressure that needs to stay there to get blood circulating all over the place. It's also important for red blood cell production. Um, there's hormones that are produced within the kidneys that stimulate the bone marrow to be producing new red blood cells. So these are some of the basic functions that the kidneys will have roles in. The kidneys do have other functions as well, a um, little bit more minor functions in different, in different areas, um, but these are the major ones that um, you'll hear a lot about. Okay, so... We talked about the anatomy. We talked about why the kidneys are important. Now, then the next question is, is well, what sort of problems are out there that can cause us to, to have issues? Um, and there have been various disorders that have been identified um, to affect the kidneys. And I, I wrote renal system on there, so uh, which is something that I, I should have noted at the beginning of our little lecture here, in that you will hear both kidney system and renal system interchangeably, they're the exact same thing. It's just, um, you'll hear a lot more like veterinarians, doctors, scientists say renal um, system, and you'll hear uh, other people say kidneys. They're honestly the exact same thing. So don't be confused if you hear that um, and think we're talking about two different things. We're not, we're talking about the same thing. So um, but back to what sort of problems are out there, we're going to go through like a list of various things that can affect the kidneys um, and hit some of the high points of things that we may see more commonly in birds, um, which may vary a little bit from other species of, of animals that, that we see as veterinarians. So first thing to talk about is infectious diseases. There are a variety of infectious diseases out there. And when we talk about infectious disease, there are four main groups of infectious diseases. There's bacterial infections, viral infections, fungal infections, and parasitic infections. So those are the four big groups of infectious diseases. Um, and when it comes to the kidneys being affected by these different organisms, there's uh, different frequencies in which they affect the kidneys. I have to say, like the fungal and parasitic organisms are less common problems affecting the kidneys of, of pet birds. So that's why they're at the lower end of this list. It's more likely that if we're getting something infectious that's damaging the kidneys, it's more likely to be bacterial or a viral infection. Um, and for most of our like adult birds um, that are in our homes and aren't exposed to other birds, of any of those infectious things, bacterial is going to be probably the most likely thing that you're going to see as a problem. The viral things that they can get that can affect their kidneys, although there's various problems out there, um, usually it's going to be more in like population settings. For example, um, polyomavirus is a virus that people will hear about a lot pertaining to parrots, um, and that's something that can cause kidney damage. Now it's usually in young birds um, and usually birds that are more of like a flock situation. So if you have a single bird as an adult in your home, you're probably not gonna be having to worry about that particular virus. Uh, bacterial infections though, again, as I mentioned, they're kind of the more common thing. There's lots of different bacteria that are out there. There isn't just one bacteria that loves to affect the kidneys. There are so many different bacterial organisms out there. Like, as if I were to like create a list of different bacterial organisms that could potentially lead to kidney damage, um, like I, that list would change probably tomorrow because. Um, there's so many different bacterial organisms out there that, okay, maybe today we haven't seen this particular bacterial infection in the kidneys, but, you know, it, it could potentially lead to problems at some point, you know, some other organism gets discovered. Um, so, you know, you'll hear things about like E. coli infection, salmonella, um, and granted, those absolutely have been identified in the kidneys, but I mean, there's just so much variety. So, um, 
to move along from the infectious diseases, uh, nutritional disorders. Nutritional disorders are definitely something that is somewhat common um, in pet birds with uh, kidney disease, or at least can be a contributing factor. I wrote down the various types of problems that we can see when it comes to nutrition. So too low of vitamin A. If a bird is having an unbalanced diet for a long period of time, like if you have a bird that is only a parent that's only eating seeds, they never get anything else, they don't have any sort of vitamin mineral supplements, they're not getting good levels of vitamin A after a period of time, they will end up getting what's called squamous metaplasia to the kidneys, where basically those kidney cells that are lining the little tubules within the kidneys become damaged. Um, they don't like re- uh, they don't regrow really appropriately. They, they switch from one cell type to a different cell type. And in doing that, it makes it so the kidneys aren't functioning as well as they're supposed to. And you can have various problems occur because of it. Um, diets too high in calcium or vitamin D. Now that's variable dependent upon the species that we're talking about, but absolutely um, you can get mineralizations of the kidneys when you have problems with those particular nutrients. Vitamin D is really important for allowing you to absorb calcium effectively from their gut. You need to have adequate exposure to UVB lighting. UVB lighting allows you to make vitamin D or you get vitamin D supplemented in the diet. That vitamin D, once it's in circulation and in the system, it goes to the intestines and tells the intestines to start absorbing calcium effectively. And if you have too much vitamin D, then you may be too effective at absorbing calcium from the gut. And if you're too effective at absor absorbing calcium from the gut, then it can actually lead to mineralizations of different tissues um, with kidneys being one of those tissues that can have mineralizations associated with it. And if you get mineralization in the kidneys or on certain other organs, it is definitely has the potential to be life-threatening. Um, and there's different times that we've seen this more in young birds again. Um, and then the other thing is too high fat in the diet. And that's going to be something that you're more likely to see again in a bird that's chronically had a poor diet. So over a long period of time, they've gotten too much fat in the diet from one source or another. Um, and because they've had too much fat in the diet for a prolonged period of time, um, you get fatty deposits in different parts of the body and you can, you can start to have problems. They can, if you guys remember several months ago, we talked about atherosclerosis, which is that issue where we see hardening of the arteries um, and impaired blood flow around the body, that cardiovascular problem. Well, it can happen within the small vessels within the kidneys themselves as well, or the vessels that are leading to the kidneys and impairing blood flow to the kidneys. Um, so it's definitely a problem that we identify. And then another problem that we can see is toxicities. Um, definitely things like lead or zinc toxicity are out there. Birds are silly and they eat things that they're not always supposed to eat. Um, and when they do eat things that become toxic, it could lead to, to kidney damage. Um, I put this picture of this little budgie up. This was one of my budgies that I used to have. Her name was Amelia. Um, and she had she had kidney disease. Um, and I managed her for quite some time with, with kidney disease. Um, and eventually she did pass away from it, but we were able to keep her comfortable for some time. And when she eventually passed away, I, I did a necropsy, which is like an autopsy in a person. And I can't stress how important those things are, honestly, even though it's sometimes hard to think about our pets having an autopsy done. Um, they really teach us a lot. And when a veterinarian is able to do a necropsy again because in people it's called an autopsy in pets and animals it's called a necropsy um when a veterinarian is able to do that they learn so much and in learning to help you know in learning what happened with an individual who passed away can help us do better for other individuals in the future and you know maybe save some lives and which i certainly learned from her um, and with her, she, what we believe, what came back on her uh, necropsy results was that she had 
likely too much vitamin D in the diet. So I may have been over supplementing without meaning to, you know, um, and having gone through that experience my, myself, I, I certainly learned uh, that I needed to be better about nutrition with her. So, um, you know, uh, of course, sad to, to lose her, but I definitely learned something that helps me with other birds. So other problems that are out there that we can see affecting the kidneys, uh, cancers. There definitely are cancers out there. Uh, there's a variety of different types of cancer. I mean, any tissue could potentially have it become cancerous. Um, but I will say that budgies in particular have been one of the species that's more well known to have uh, renal carcinomas. And uh, again, that word renal means kidney um, and carcinoma is a more malignant type of cancer. Um, and so, so it's really well reported in the literature. Um, so something to be aware of that we do see cancer associated with the kidneys. Other things is obstructive disease. Obstructive disease, um, it can be from two different types of obstruction. One type of obstruction is where there's like some sort of mass that is causing compression on the kidneys. And so something outside of the kidneys is physically leading to obstruction and pressure on the kidneys. And the most common thing uh, that does that is um, actually when a female bird is laying and she has an egg that is sitting in her uh, salomic cavity. And if it's sitting in there for too long, putting pressure on just the right area, it can actually cause some, some kidney problems. That's probably the most common time that I see um, obstructive diseases of the kidneys. It's just those female birds that are laying and uh, that egg is just pushing right up on those, those kidneys. Okay. Um, the other thing that can happen is if there's an obstruction to the ureter. And so what the ureter is, so you have your kidney and then coming off of your kidney is a little tube called the ureter and that ureter connects the kidney to the cloaca. So stuff is your excretory products from the kidneys are flushed down that little ureter tube down into the cloaca and then out the body. And if there is something that is obstructing that little ureter tube, then stuff can't flow out of those kidneys. And because stuff can't flow out of those kidneys, you can have toxins and stuff sort of build up in those kidneys and uh, not get filtered and be in the blood and, and cause um, some real major problems. As far as what those things are that can come, cause obstruction, it's usually what's called a ureteral lift, um, where there's something actually like uh, little urates that gets backed up in the ureters. Thankfully, that doesn't happen very commonly. I mean, I, like I've uh, probably seen like one case maybe, um, but it's really not super common, thankfully. What's more common is when, as I mentioned, the anatomy where you have your kidney, the ureter, and then it goes to the cloaca and stuff goes out the cloaca, is if there's something in the cloaca itself that's pushing on that ureter. So your ureter is functioning fine. It's a nice normal tube, but then something in the cloaca is pushing up and pinching it off. And again, that can happen with an egg if an egg's kind of stuck right there at the cloaca, or if there's some sort of mass in the cloaca itself, um, that can lead to compression of the ureters. Um, so those are, those are obstructive diseases, something that's limiting flow of stuff out of the kidneys. Other problems that we see, um, metabolic disorders. And metabolic disorders are gonna be things like dehydration, um, gout or something called amyloidosis. And I'm not going to get too much into amyloidosis because one, we don't see it really commonly in parrots. It's kind of more a, um, like a waterfowl thing. Uh, but in our pet parrots, we absolutely see birds get dehydrated and it can make it so you don't have as good sort of blood flow through those kidneys. You don't have as good of excretion through that ureter. And then you can have a buildup of that uric acid in the body. So dehydration can happen for a variety of different reasons. I mean, like any disease process that happens could potentially have a component of it lead to dehydration. Um, and so, those birds that are dehydrated, it's really important that we get them fluids. And so anyone who has brought their bird to a vet, um, 
I'm sure has had their veterinarian at some point recommend like, hey, you know, if the bird is presenting for being sick, uh, we probably should do some fluids with this individual. Fluid therapy is one of the most common things that we do with most illnesses. Um, not necessarily all illnesses, but many, many illnesses can benefit from a little bit of fluid support. And um, so that, that's why, you know, we want to give them fluids because we want them to be hydrated well so that they can have normal functioning of their kidneys and pass out uh, toxins and things like that from the body. Now, as far as what gout is, a lot of people know about gout because people can get gout, right? And so gout is where you get these buildup of uric acid crystals within your joint spaces. And it can be very uncomfortable for people who suffer from gout. Um, because if you look under the microscope at what a gout crystal is or uric acid crystal is, and again, the uric acid is that white product that is getting excreted from the kidneys that you see in your bird's droppings every day, um, that white product is composed of uric acid crystals. And if you were to look at that underneath the microscope, when I say crystals, I mean crystals. They are little crystals. They look like little spikes, like spears. And so you can imagine how painful it would be to have these little spikes stuck inside of your joint spaces and your joint is supposed to like move nice and fluid and feel comfortable and if you have like these little spicules and spikes hanging out in that joint space it's not going to feel very comfortable to move your joints so uh that is definitely something that happens in people it's very uncomfortable but it happens in birds too now the mechanism of why it happens in birds is slightly altered from what it is in people and i'm not a human physician so i can't talk too much more about uh, gout in people, but I think from what I read, gout in people is more of like a genetic uh, disorder versus in birds, it happens because of kidney disease. If your kidneys are not functioning the way that they're supposed to, you're not getting rid of toxins, right? And again, one of those major toxins we talked about that the body is excreting, that the kidneys are getting out of, that, out of the body is those uric acid crystals. And so if those kidneys aren't functioning well, uric acid crystals aren't getting excreted. If they're not getting excreted, they stay within the body and circulation within the blood. And the body goes, well, we don't really want to have all these uric acid crystals hanging out in the blood. So we got to do with something with them. So they actually will precipitate out into joints or onto organs. If it precipitates out onto organs, that honestly can be a death sentence, especially if it precipitates out onto the heart. If you get uric acid crystals on the heart, like that can be fatal rapidly. Now, if you get it into the joints, it's not fatal, but it's uncomfortable. And it's an indication that you've got kidney problems going on. And so you have to not only deal with this gout that's in the joints where the patient is painful, the bird's painful from it, but you also got to deal with the primary kidney problem too. And this picture that I have up there, I know, I know it's a little bit blurry, but I couldn't find one that wasn't blurry. That was one of my own. This is a little parrot lad. Um, and the purpose of this photo is for you to look at this foot. This little parrot lad you can see this toe, see how big and puffy and swollen is. Now, I know this picture, this digit is a little further back, but it's not as big and puffy as this one. Like this one's a pretty normal size digit. This one is really quite large and puffy. This little bird had gout in her joints. Um, and she did have it in this foot too, but it was higher up on the leg. And sometimes owners can see this at home. Not only can they see just the swollen foot appearance, but if they look really closely, and if you happen to have a bird that has more pink skin as opposed to a bird that has like uh, more pigment on the skin, if you have one that is pink, sometimes you can actually even see white little stuff underneath the skin. What that is, that's that uric acid that that bird is normally excreting in its droppings is now inside of those joints. And so again, they're little crystals, they're quite uncomfortable. Um, so this little parrotlet, uh, she was managed with certain medications that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Um, and then also we really had to control her pain level. Um, and every once in a while you have to like open joints up and flush, flush those crystals out. Uh, there's some issues with doing that. So it's not a completely risk-free procedure in and of itself. Um, but, you know, sometimes these, these problems that these patients come in with are multifactorial and we have to deal with them on various levels. Um, just a couple of other problems to hit on just very briefly that can happen with the kidneys, congenital problems. Sometimes you can get what's called renal aplasia, meaning that there's a portion of the kidneys that doesn't develop. Uh, I have seen that in two birds. I saw it once in a mucon, and once in a uh, molucan cockatoo. And then renal cysts are another thing. Those don't happen a lot, but they do occasionally occur where you have a cyst that develops congenitally 
um, on the kidney. And then anomalies, so like just weird oddities sometimes happen. Uh, I didn't want to get too much into those because those are just like the weird things that we really don't see very frequently at all. And when it does happen, we just scratch our head and go, that was weird. Um, okay, so to, we know, okay, we know the anatomy, we know the physiology, we know it can happen as far as um, various diseases and problems that are out there. But what is an owner likely to see at home? Because with part of these webinars, my hope is not only to like educate people, of course, about different diseases and, and things, um, but hopefully like people can, you know, take a critical eye and look at their individual birds and go, okay, well, you know, maybe something's different. What could potentially be going on? Um, and, you know, do I need to take them to a veterinarian to help figure out what we have occurring here? So with kidney disease, things that you could potentially be seeing at home that might tell you that there's something going on with the kidneys um, are all listed here. They're sometimes, unfortunately, very nonspecific. You may see increased urination and increased drinking. Because those kidneys are not functioning well, one of the functions of the kidneys is maintaining appropriate hydration. If they're not functioning well in disease, they're not going to, you're not going to maintain good hydration within the body. And so they're not going to hold on to fluids appropriately. More fluid is going to come out in the droppings. So those three different parts of the dropping, the stool, the urate, and the urine, you're going to see an increased component to the urine. Um, so it's just more watery. And then because they have more fluid that's getting lost and leaking from the body, usually physiologically, their, their body's going to recognize it. Hey, I'm dehydrated. And it's going to tell their brain, go drink some water. You're thirsty. So they're going to feel thirsty. They're going to go to their water dish quite frequently. You may see the water dish going down more um, than you used to. Another thing is just lethargy. So just being quiet, just not feeling great, just sitting around more, not active, just being more of like a little reclusive um and sometimes antisocial you know sometimes they're just like oh, i don't want to i don't want to come out i don't want to do anything right now they just sit around more dietary changes sometimes happen again unfortunately it's really non-specific it's something that you can see dietary changes from a variety of different disorders but what I mean by dietary changes is more, a lot of times they'll go off their food or they may be eating less. Um, they may be really picky for just the things that are really delicious because they feel crummy and they only want to eat what tastes good. Um, and then the last thing, poor use of the limbs. The reason that that is a sign that somebody could see at home that indicates a problem, um, I'm going to actually go back to that x-ray image. So I'm gonna shift back through everything because I think I can describe it better with showing you guys this picture here. So again, here's the x-ray of this bird. And to orient y'all to the x-ray, head's over here, tail's over here. These are our hind limbs and our wings are being pulled up. Our kidneys are placed right back there underneath that pelvis. Well, um, if you have certain kidney diseases, not all kidney diseases, but certain kidney diseases, Say, for example, you have an enlargement of the kidney for some reason, whether that happens because of inflammation from an infection, cancerous development, some sort of kidney cyst that's occurring. Um, when those kidneys become enlarged, there's only so much space they can take up. And so sometimes they end up putting pressure higher up above them. And from the brain, you have our, your nervous system, right? We have our central nervous system, brain, and then the spinal cord comes down the spinal canal. And then you have nerves that branch out to the wings, to the legs, to different parts of the body from that, um, from the spinal cord, from that spinal canal, right? So right by those hind limbs, at the end of that spinal um, cord, it's kind of branching right by those kidneys there. So if the kidneys become enlarged, they can put pressure on the branches that are coming out of the spinal canal uh, and spinal cord right there. Um, and so you may end up having the nerves that are leading to those limbs be compressed. And then because those nerves are getting compressed, they don't have as good function to those hind limbs. And then because they don't have as good function to those hind limbs, you may see them being really wobbly. They may not be able to grasp appropriately. Or the other thing that you may potentially see is they're just dangling like a foot, like it's just like very limp. And, and owners will sometimes think that something got broken. And it's not that something got broken, it's that the nerve supply is just really having a hard time. It's getting compressed by this gigantic kidney. So those are some of the signs that an owner may see. Again, unfortunately, none of them are like specific that this is 
when you see a dangling limb, it only means kidney disease. That's not the case. Um, you can see a dangling limb from, you know, other problems too. Um, whether that, again, is there was actually a fracture or there's some other sort of nervous system problem or what have you. Um, but something to something to keep in mind when you see these particular problems, kidneys might be might be uh, a uh, problem. Okay, so say I have a patient that comes into the hospital and is presenting with those particular signs. Well, what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to do some diagnostics to determine could this patient have kidney disease? Because I do frequently have birds that come in that are having more urine um, production and drinking more. And although I know kidney problems is one of the things I need to worry about, I also have to worry about liver problems. I have to worry about certain gastrointestinal disorders. Um, I have to worry sometimes about like just an infection within the crop or within the, the cloaca. Um, I mean, I have to worry about toxins. There's there's various problems that can all result in I'm drinking too much, I'm peeing too much. So we have to do number one, blood work. Blood work is one of our biggest helpful indicators of kidney problems. Um, at least at this point in time, maybe when we become more advanced, because there's always advances in, in veterinary medicine and just medicine in general, um, maybe we'll have something that's a little bit better. But right now, kind of the main thing that people will often use to say, hey, there's something going on with the kidneys, is just looking at simple blood work, a biochemistry or a chemistry panel. That might be what a, vet, a veterinarian says to an owner. I'd like to run a chemistry panel on your bird to look for kidney problems. And if that's done, the main thing that we see that can tell us, oh, kidney problems could potentially be at play here is those uric acid levels are increased because again, kidneys are damaged. They're not functioning like they should. They're not getting rid of toxins. That uric acid, that white thing that's coming through in the droppings every day is now staying in circulation. And so when you do blood work, you see that uric acid level is increased from what it should be. Um, now I will say that uric acid levels can go up slightly from just simple dehydration and not without kidney problems, or if there is, again, some obstruction to flow out of the ureter, you know. So it doesn't have to mean that there's major kidney, like full on damage to the kidneys, but we see that value being increased. Now, the other frustrating thing is you have to have 75% functional loss before uh, that uric acid level goes up. So that's kind of frustrating because in early kidney disease, we're not going to be able to identify it on blood work. So that's why I say one day, maybe we'll have better testing that uh, someone discovers something that's a more sensitive and early indicator of kidney problems. But for right now, the uric acid level is the main thing we look at. Now, sometimes on that blood work, okay, say I get my blood work back and I have high kidney values. I go, okay, well, what other things do I need to look for that could potentially give me a clue as to why I have kidney problems? Because, okay, I have kidney problems, but why, why did it occur? We went over that list of all those different things, the infectious things, the cancers, the toxins, nutritional disorders, all those different things that could cause kidney problems. In this bird that I'm seeing right now, why is it having kidney problems? I have to look at other tests to really know why this individual is having problems and answer that effectively. I might look at just, again, that chemistry panel um, or the CDC, which is uh, often paired with a chemistry panel. Um, and I'm looking at lipids, like is there high fats that I'm thinking maybe there could potentially be some fatty problem that's associated with, with this. Um, I might be looking for a high white cell count to indicate an infection. I might be looking for high calcium levels. Um, uh, if we're concerned about a vitamin D toxicity or a, um, um, you know, too much calcium in the diet, that sort of thing. The other thing I might want to do is do imaging studies. And that's where I'm going to do things like radiographs, um, to look at the size and of the kidneys, the position, which, you know, we showed you on that original image, um, do an ultrasound. Sometimes uh, we can do that as well. There are limitations of ultrasounds in birds, um, just because of their anatomy being a little unique and having lots of air sacs, it makes it so that ultrasound is a little harder than for them. Sometimes we can certainly do ultrasounds and there's certain organs you can ultrasound better, like the liver or the heart, or if there's ever any fluid in the, the belly, then ultrasounds can be really, really uh, helpful. Mr. Troublemaker is just getting into trouble again. Um, so uh, ultrasound isn't necessarily something that 
every veterinarian is going to recommend be done um, because of the limitations. And so it's going to kind of depend on the individual bird as to whether or not an ultrasound is going to work for this individual. And then the, the CT scan, I have a picture here of a bird that was getting a CT scan done. Um, and the bird was getting a CT scan done because it was having was one of the, because it was having some kidney problems. Um, so the bird is anesthetized and we have it hooked up to uh, fluids and we have it hooked up to its little ECG. So we're monitoring its heart rate and we're monitoring its oxygen saturation. Um, but we were doing a CT scan to see if we could better identify what was going on with its kidneys. Um, and they a lot of times we do have to do contrast to really tell. Um, what organs are uh, looking like. And I know you guys have had Dr. Eccles talk with you um, in the past about CTs and, and things like that. Um, and the real major advances that have been made with this sort of technology. Um, but one of the things that helps us and has been a great advance is that we do contrast. So we actually give injections of um, a contrast agent that lights up the kidneys. And so this, this bird actually did have uh, some contrast given in, in its fluids uh, to help get those images that we needed. There are some risks associated with it. So your veterinarian would talk with you about those risks. Um, other things that we can do. Okay, so a lot of people will wanna look at the urine to see if there is something they can understand about how the kidneys are functioning. And in mammals, you absolutely wanna look at the urine. Like if this was a mammalian patient, for sure, if I'm worried about kidney problems, I need to be, I need to absolutely 100% be looking at its urine to get a little bit more information. Birds are a little harder though, because they like to be harder in different ways. Um, and urine samples are not as helpful. Um, so I'm not always, checking a urine sample on a bird that I have that has kidney problems um, because you just don't always yield a lot of information. And so um, we sometimes will do them to look at the concentrating ability of the kidneys, but eh, there's some issues with how helpful that information can be. We can look at certain analytes. I put urine, NAG, or GGT. Those are certain uh, things that you can assess for in the urine to help tell if there's been some kidney damage. So when it comes to looking at urine for birds, honestly, those two things that I put at the bottom, the NAG and GGT, those are uh, probably likely to be the more helpful things. Um, biopsies. Sometimes we need to do biopsies with the kidneys to really know what's going on, particularly if we have a mass on the kidney. Um, we, if we want to find out if it's something that's cancerous, a uh, biopsy may be necessary, but there are risks associated with that. You know, it's not something that's um, a non-invasive procedure. It certainly can be it uh, can be a little bit more invasive. I mean, there's definitely ways that we uh, can do biopsies that are minimally invasive, where we do like endoscopies. So we make just a tiny little opening, use a scope to go into where the kidneys are, um, take a tiny little sample and be done and, and have it sometimes be rather quick. But um, there's still risks associated with it. And then uh, I put specific testing. And so that's going to be where like, say that I have a bird that comes in and I have my high kidney values and maybe have some other changes on x-rays or other portions of the blood work that make me go, hmm, could this potentially be a bird that has like heavy metal toxicity? Well, then I need to do specific testing for heavy metal uh, toxins themselves to see if that could potentially be um, what's causing our problems or certain infectious diseases. If I think I maybe have polyoma, say I was having a problem with some young birds, um, I could test them for, for polyoma to find out if that was what was causing kidney problems. Um, okay, so now how do we treat the kidneys? So we have now gone to the vet, the vet has determined why we have kidney problems uh, or that we have kidney problems and hopefully been able to figure out the underlying reason why the kidney problems occurred. And I, I will say, I want people to know from this that sometimes we aren't able to figure out exactly why the kidney problems happen. Sometimes by the time that a bird presents with illness, whatever the underlying process was that started the kidney problems, that has resolved itself. So say, for example, they had an infection that caused the kidney damage. Maybe the infection has resolved itself, but the damage was done. We still have the damage to the kidneys. And so now we're having to deal with the after effects of now we need to support these kidneys and keep these kidneys happy and healthy and normal and function. Um, so as far as what we can do, 
to help treat the kidneys, uh, fluid support. So as I mentioned, a lot of veterinarians do like to do uh, fluids uh, for many different dis disorders that can happen. And um, absolutely, because the kidneys, if they're not functioning well, we don't have as appropriate of hydration. If we don't have as appropriate of hydration, we want to keep our patient well hydrated. So fluids are going to be part of the treatment plan. And I'll also tell you that a lot of times in early stages, or when I first diagnose a kidney problem, depending upon where the uric acid level is, sometimes I'm not too sure, is this just dehydration or is there true kidney disease going on? And if I want to figure that out, what I can do is I can give them fluids and then recheck their uric acid levels. And if those uric acid levels stay elevated, despite being well hydrated, then I know I've got kidney problems. Versus if those uric acid levels improve after giving fluids, then I can say, okay, well, um, this patient was just dehydrated. My poor intern is trying to eat the computer and her backpack. It's very appetizing to him today. Um, all right. So next things uh, that a uh, veterinarian will often do as far as treatment for the kidneys. Uh, a very, very, very common medication is called allopurinol. What allopurinol does is it actually kind of blocks the pathway for the production of uric acid. So you don't get as much uric acid being produced in the body. Um, and I would say it's probably the most common kidney medication that people will use as the first thing in parrots. There's certain birds that you can't actually use that medication in, but parrots do well with it. Um, another medication is called colchicine. That medication as well kind of helps reduce the production of our uric acid. There's another medication that I have not used yet called case, And it's something that's available. It's not available in the US. It's available um, in other parts of the world. So I haven't had the opportunity to get to use it yet. But what that medication does is it's an injectable medication and it takes that uric acid that the kidneys should be excreting. And it actually breaks it down further into a less toxic form. There have been studies that it's been uh, found to be effective in births. Um, so that might be something that more people might be using in the future or more or veterinarians in other countries may be using it. Um, I just don't have any personal experience with it yet. So something, something for the future maybe. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids. I know we've talked about omega-3 fatty acids in various lectures before, um, and we've talked about their health benefits. The, the main thing about omega-3 fatty acids that makes them so great is they help to reduce inflammation. And so when you give an omega-3 fatty acid, uh, it has to build up in the body over time. It's not something that you're going to have them have benefits from like day one. It, it does take some time to build up in the body. But once it gets up to like appropriate levels in the body, it does have an anti-inflammatory effect. And because a lot of the disorders that we can see uh, that lead to kidney problems have some inflammatory component associated with them, it potentially could be helpful in that way. Um, and then also I put low dose aspirin. It's not for every patient that has kidney problems but it can be beneficial for certain um, kidney problems. It actually prevents the um, production of a certain inflammatory meter, mediator that is involved in like acute kidney damage. So like sudden kidney damage um, can be occur from this one inflammatory mediator. And when you give that low dose of aspirin, it stops that particular inflammatory mediator from being produced. So it's not for use in all, all types of kidney disease, um, but it's appropriate for certain ones. And that's something that I think is really important for people to understand too, like, okay, there's lots of different things that can cause different types of kidney problems, right? And so all these things that I'm talking about here, your veterinarian doesn't have to do every single one of these things to treat your bird. They may do one or two, they may do a combination of several, or maybe only one is going to be appropriate. Um, so there is some variability in treatment depending upon the main underlying reason which gets me into treating the specific problems. So let's say that we are concerned that a bird is having kidney problems more specifically because of dietary reasons. So we talked about vitamin A deficiencies. We've talked about too much calcium, too much vitamin D. We also talked about too high of fats. Um, we need to analyze the diet when a bird comes in with kidney problems and say, okay, what is this bird eating? Could there potentially be anything in the diet that is contributing? And there's many cases I have to say that I've had that have come in with inappropriate diets uh, with 
um, low levels of vitamin A. And so, you know, sometimes we're doing those other things on that other slide, uh, but we're also adjusting the diet. So we're putting them on something that has more appropriate levels of vitamin A in the diet. Or um, like what I was mentioning that my, one of my own little budgies had passed away from kidney disease. And um, when we did a necropsy with her and we were able to look at her kidneys, the pathologist was concerned that the patient, you know, she was getting too much uh, vitamin D. And so I didn't know it at the time when I had her because I didn't do a biopsy because I was too, I, I wasn't, I didn't want to, uh, because she's such a tiny individual, I didn't want to take the risks associated with doing a biopsy of her kidneys because I had her being really well treated. So I kind of made the decision that, you know, she's doing okay. I'm going to hold on doing a biopsy with her kidneys and not put her through the risks associated with that. So I didn't know why she had kidney disease before she passed away. But after when I found out that she had kidney disease, probably because I was giving her food that was a little too much, uh, had a little too much vitamin uh, D or calcium in it. Um, it allowed me to adjust the way that I fed my other individuals. Um, so, you know, again, it goes back to those necropsies sometimes can be helpful for us to help other birds in the future. So um, something that I, I encourage people to consider having done, even though it's kind of hard sometimes to think about doing that with your pet um, after they've passed away, but it, it can be really quite helpful. And it's also a good thing for like closure for people too, but I digress. Uh, so other things, um, treating specific problems. Again, if I have a bird that I find that it has kidney problems because it has a toxin, it got exposed to a toxin, like for example, zinc, then it might be needing to do some chelation therapy to bind up any zinc in its body and, and or too much excessive zinc in its body and help excrete it. Um, obstructive disorder. So like I had mentioned, one of the most common things that I see that causes obstruction is like an egg that's sitting in that salombic cavity for too long and it's putting pressure on the, the, the kidneys. Um, well, if I have a bird that's egg bound, I need to get that egg out of there. So uh, as we've talked about in previous lectures before about how we manage those cases where we end up doing uh, removal of the egg, uh, I have to have that as a part of my treatment plan, of course, for if a bird presents with high kidney values um, and they've got an egg inside of them, I got to get that egg out. And thankfully, a lot of those birds, once you get that egg out, you've removed the obstructive process, you get them some fluids for hydration, all that sort of stuff. Uh, when you recheck their kidney values, a, a good percentage of them have those kidney values go back to normal. There are some who that egg or other obstruction has been in there too long um, and they've had some permanent damage to those kidneys. But I have to say, I've gotten lucky, I think, and I've had a lot of them that improve. And then of course, if there's any specific infectious disease that is present, treating them with antibiotics, antifungals, antiparasitics, whatever the infectious organism is, using the particular um, antimicrobial that is appropriate for that particular organism. And this particular picture, um is of a bird that had a renal cyst and it was a rather large bird it was actually the one that was getting the ct scan done um where we actually went in and were able to drain the fluid from that that cyst and that's actually what's in this little syringe here um is the fluid that we were draining from the kidney so um okay i think that was my last slide yes it was my last slide so i'm going to stop sharing and then i can open it up for any questions that anybody has in the last little bit of time we have here? Uh, yes, we do have some questions for you. So let's see what we have first out to the gate here. Um, that was like a good walkthrough once again. I love your slide because they're just, the visuals help so much. So, um, okay, here we go. Ready? Um, so they say, I understand that high uric acid levels in blood chemistry tests are usually due to some form of kidney disease. Um, so they have a seven-year-old female pionis that's always had below normal UA levels. Should they be worried about kidney or other conditions? Um, if low UA weren't indicative of a health issue, the normal range would start at zero. Is that correct? Okay. And also, if relevant, calcium has been normal, but phosphorus slightly above or below the the low end of normal range over the years. So. Okay. So um, if the uric acid is low, we don't have to worry about kidney disease. So if this bird has consistently had have, have, has had a low uric acid, you're okay. You don't have to worry about kidney disease in this individual. Um, 
rarely you will see a low uric acid associated with liver disease because uric acid is actually produced in the liver. But I will tell you that is usually when you have like liver failure. And the few times that I've actually caught it, the bird passed away within like 24 hours. So you don't get that low uric acid from liver failure until it's honestly like the end. Um, so if this bird has been dealing with, has had low uric acids, what that tells me is that that's that just that bird's normal. There, we have these reference ranges that we create. So basically like when a lab, um, you know, we have this chemistry analyzer, we get a whole bunch of birds of the same species, you know, so a whole bunch of bunch of Amazons or macaws or whatever, um, you know, and when I mean, when I say a whole bunch, I usually mean like 20. In human medicine, they have like over a thousand people like having blood contributing to getting a reference range. Um, but in veterinary medicine, we often don't have as high of uh, um, individuals to get reference ranges from, particularly from these exotic pets that we, uh, you know, not as many people have them. So we can't uh, have as high of sample populations as we would like to have. So these reference ranges we generate are often generated on a much smaller group of, of individuals. So the Kaik, you know, reference ranges may really be based off of like 10 or 20 individuals. And so there's going to be some outliers um, on those other those ends of those reference ranges. Um, so we may just have this individual who's just a little on the lower side, and that's normal for this individual. If it has persistently been low for years, then that's okay. You know, that's something that, well, that's that bird's normal, which is interesting then because then um, in the future, say you were to start having rises in those uric acid levels, well, then that's what the veterinary has to pay attention to. It's like, okay, you're always down at this level, but hey, now today your uric acid is at this other level. This is interesting. Something's probably going on. So I think there are more parts to that question that I might have missed. Um, let's see, the part was, uh, where'd it go? So the uh, has always had below normal UA levels. Um, and then, oh, they wanna know if it was, if it's relevant, the calcium has been normal, but phosphorus slightly above or below the low end of normal is for okay. years. So um, the phosphorus, I will say, will will go up and down a little bit more. And, and remember that at the beginning of the talk where we were saying that phosphorus is one of the things that the kidneys kind of tightly regulate. Um, there's going to be a little bit more variation in the phosphorus. So I'm okay with the phosphorus being a little bit lower. And if there's certain times where it's a little higher, that bird was probably just dehydrated at the time of the blood draw. Um, because it, it, it happens very frequently that birds will come into the office and they're a little bit dehydrated by the time we draw blood. And the reason that often happens is because, well, they weren't drinking water on the car ride over because they're a little nervous about being on the car ride. They're not drinking water while they're waiting up in the exam, you know, in the um, lobby. They're not drinking water while they're sitting in the exam room because they're nervous. Then by the time the veterinarian gets their exam done, takes them in the back, does their blood draw, they may be a little bit subclinically dehydrated to where we can't assess a level of dehydration on their physical exam, but they're just a little dehydrated and it shows up in the blood work. Um, so that's probably why that phosphorus has been high before. But importantly, the calcium has been normal. And so that's really good. We're glad that that calcium has stayed in an appropriate range. That's what I really want to hear because that calcium is going to be a little bit more tightly regulated. Um, so it's something that I'm glad to hear that that bird has had normal calciums over the years. Okay, that's interesting. I'm just now wondering um, if you're getting a blood draw on your bird, if there's some prep work involved. I mean, obviously you can't like say your bird and you drink like two glasses of water before we go in, but like for food, like eating beforehand or uh, yeah. the time of day of the appointment, all that kind of stuff could kind of play into it. It will sometimes play a role, particularly with the kidneys. Like if I have a bird that I did blood work on and we found that it had high kidney values, but they were just a little high, then a lot of times I will need to resample and say, hold on, we got to see if this is a true true kidney problems are going on or no this, this this individual is just a little dehydrated and so i may have to tell owners okay we're going to have you come back we're going to resample but i need you to make sure the bird has drank you know x amount of water before they get here and, and it's hard because birds aren't you know going to drink on command so sometimes i have people like flavor it with like a like, little bit of pedialyte something to interest them or yeah. give them um some sort of veggies that were nice and highly moisturized, you know, uh, so that we're trying to get more fluids into them in some way naturally. Interesting. All right. So we have a question um, about a three-year-old male budgie that has, that passes a lot of urine. So he eats pellets, some seed and veggies. 
and they've had him since he was a chick and he's always done this. So they wanted to, they didn't see what the other budgies they've had. And they want to know um, if there's anything to be concerned. His, his, his CBC doesn't show anything abnormal. So bird passing a lot of urine, is that concerning? They said, it, like, they said his CBC is normal, but did they do a chemistry on him? Um, I don't know. Maybe they can. Um, okay. That would be something, that. If, if they haven't done a chemistry panel, I would recommend doing that because it's good that the CBC is done. The CBC is looking at red cells, white cells, and then thrombocytes or platelets. Um, and so if that's good, then I'm happy there probably isn't something infectious going on. Um, but I would want to know what the chemistry panel is to look at liver functioning and kidney function on that. Um, and so if they haven't had that done, I would recommend doing that because, yeah, drinking drinking more and producing more urine could be from kidney problems, but it could also be from liver problems. Or, again, sometimes there's GI issues going on that could make them drink more or urinate more. And then also the other thing, too, that's sometimes very frustrating sometimes it's behaviorally. There are some individuals who just like to drink um, and then they urinate more because they're drinking more. And so it's tough when we have those situations because sometimes owners put a whole bunch of money into like doing all these diagnostics and everything's fine, which is great, but also like, you know, sometimes frustrating. <laughs> oh my goodness. And budgies seem to do everything fast on fast, fast yeah. forward, fast speed. Maybe they're, you know, <laughs> metabolism's crazy on those little guys too, probably. Yep. That's right. Yep. All right. So I think, shoot, that's all we have time for, for the, the, um, the answers, but, um, or for our questions, but we'll, we'll try to get through the rest by, by email. So if you, uh, if we didn't get to your question today, we'll try to uh, send you an answer via email. Um, so, uh, wow. Okay. And I, I got announced today is winter. So we're, uh, giving away some, uh, giving away, uh, the, the fever, uh, foraging pack, as well as another the fever food of your bird's choice. And that winner is Denise Woolsey. So congratulations, Denise. Hope that makes you and your birds weekend. Um, and just a couple of announcements. One is uh, we're gonna be, uh, next week, our webinar, we're gonna be back with Lisa Bono. And she is going to be um, talking about exercising bird to, um, sorry, exercising bird to health. So uh, getting your, um, you know, your perch potato off the perch, uh, some some exercising tips so that's going to be a, a fun one i think we're gonna have lisa run around uh, demonstrating so she'll she'll have to do some some pre uh pre-webinar stretching or something nice. <laughs> um also i just want to remind everybody tomorrow september 17th is national pet bird day so i uh, saw that i'm excited <laughs> right so let's I, I would love to see pictures um on on the beavers like facebook social media um submit it uh, of you, of what you and your bird did on uh, National Pet Bird Day, like special meal, some fun dancing video. I don't know, something fun. Do something fun with your bird tomorrow if you can. So, especially, I mean, every day, but tomorrow, as a reminder, it's National Pet Bird Day. So, all right. And uh, Dr. Lamb, we will see. You, well, gosh, October twenty first. Okay, everybody. Yep. Looking Mark forward to it. See you then. All right. Um, thank you once again, seriously, like, I, I just can't believe we've done this many webinars with you. It's just, it's so nice of you to be with us and, and a royal stay away from that intern's backpack and yeah. <laughs> what else have you got? The laptop. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like the one thing that interns got to learn on the first day is, is hide the stuff from, from yeah, hide the stuff from a royal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, on that end. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. Um, until next time, everyone stay safe and all the best to your flock. Bye. Bye.